Good evening. This is Maestro Cortella with the Dawn of War 3 open beta cast. Man, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue as easily. Not quite as used to it. It's kind of new. Um, so what I've got right here is a kind of a Space Marine gameplay video of, of me actually playing uh, the Dawn of War open beta. Gameplay might not be great. Uh, still very much learning the ropes of this game. Um, but we actually do get to take a look at some actual gameplay footage and I'm going to tell you just a little bit of what I've learned about this game so far, kind of how, how I'm viewing it. The camera might be a little bit uh, erratic because this is actually video of me playing the game and I'm commentating it after the fact. I'm not doing live commentary, it's unfortunately something that I, I don't quite have the talent for. I'm not very good at playing and talking at the same time. I'm very quiet when I play. Um, so the camera might be a little all over the place while I talk about different things. So we have the Space Marines right here, got my Pink Angel skin. So what I'm seeing from this so far is that the Space Marines, or maybe even just the the, the way the production kind of works in general, you do get some production buildings, but you start out with the Stronghold. Uh, for the Space Marines, they can build two units from the Stronghold, Tactical Marines and Servitors. Servitors, of course, being a builder unit, and Tactical Marines kind of just being their, obviously, their default ranged unit. So, you, basically, you can put out a regular combat squad without having to build an additional production building. And then out of the production buildings, there are three additional production buildings in addition to the, uh, in addition to the Stronghold. So, for the Space Marines, those three production buildings are the Barracks, the Doctrine Chapel, and Machine Cult. So, you start out with the... Earlier on in the game, uh, your two infantry production buildings are the Doctrine Chapel and the Barracks. And the way I'm seeing it right now is probably somewhat like Company of Heroes, where instead of building both, you're probably, at least the way I see it, is you're probably going to kind of have to pick between one or the other. So either the Barracks, the Barracks gives you access to Scouts, Sniper Scouts, and Assault Marines. Whereas the Doctrine Chapel gives you access to both Devastator variants, LAS Cannons and Heavy Bolters, and you can also build tax from it too for, for whatever reason, although I don't find that particularly helpful. Just the way I see it, it doesn't really seem like it's very economically sustainable to build both and to try to build uh, units from both. I could, of course, be wrong here. This is just my way of seeing it. And part of the reason I'm even seeing it this way is kind of my own pre-existing framework that actually comes from Company of Heroes, even though I'm obviously more of a Dawn of War 2 player. Uh, did have a little bit of, exp of experience with both Company of Heroes 1 and 2. So um, I do have that knowledge of, of how those games were played. And then later on, uh, once you upgrade tiers, you'll go into the, the machine cult as well to get, to get vehicles and later game units. So I built three tax squads right here. Another thing we might even also be able to see on the interface is right above the kind of the control panel, and by control panel I'm meaning where you issue where it shows the different orders for the units, we see actually three drop pod icons. Two of those icons are locked, one is not. And in those icons for the Space Marines, you can actually click on the drop pod and build a unit inside of it. I mean obviously it doesn't actually build inside of it, but the idea is you build a unit, you assign it to a drop pod. Uh, and it will stay in the drop pod un until you choose to deep strike. And you can actually build, I'm pretty sure, just about any unit from the drop pod, or and, and put it in the drop pod. And then when you want, you can deep strike. It's I actually like it very much that you have that deep striking as part of the game. Maybe just from you know Soulstorm, they realize that steel rain is a viable tactic. And we can see that two of them are locked right now. Only one is actually available. And the reason why is that it's it's locked by tier. So in tier 1, you have only one drop pod available. Tier 2, you get two. And by tier 3, you have all three available. Um, you can, there's a cooldown after each drop pod, so you can't drop them infinitely. And right here, we actually see, uh, I am, I believe this is me. Is it me? Yeah, that's me, me dropping in Kill Team Iron Maw. So I actually had enough elite points. And elite points are a resource that gathers very slowly over time. Kill Team Iron Maw, I talked a little bit before in my previous video, is the lowest cost elite for the Space Marines. 
So as the lowest cost elite, they are theoretically the one with the least uh, amount of impact. But, you know, from what I've seen so far, I'm liking Kill Team Iron Maw, and I have a personal feeling that they will be uh, a useful elite in the actual competitive multiplayer of this game. But, Kill Team Iron Maw basically, it more or less functions as a beefed up tax squad, and then they have the option of either getting, um, I believe it's Fuhrer Tactics, which gives them a Flamer, or Malleus Tactics, which gives them a Missile Launcher. Lately I've been choosing the Missile Launcher, decided to have that extra AV as opposed to the extra anti-infantry. Of course, this is kind of my own simplistic way of thinking, I'm not sure if how the game mechanics are actually working, and if it would just be better to get a Flamer. Um, but what's really good about Kill Team Iron Maw is that unlike other elites, you can place them anywhere. You can place them anywhere, they come down in the drop pod, and the way I used it is I actually used the drop pod as a way to help win that engagement. Because the drop pod itself has an impact, it has a literal impact. It will come down on the field, knock back whatever units it lands on, and that can kind of help to give you a slight advantage. Um, most other elites cannot be put anywhere. Kill Team Iron Maw can. Um, most other elites, I'm not sure what the exact rules are. If you try to place an elite in a spot where you can't, it will explain the exact rules, but I don't rem remember them exactly uh, from reading the game. It's something like within range of a power core, maybe in range of a production building. But what's useful what, about Kill Team Iron Maw is that they also act as a spot where you can drop other elites. So you can have Kill Team Iron Maw in the front of a battle, and then later on in the game you can drop Solaria right there, or Gabriel Angelos, or whatever other elite you want to drop. And that's why I have a feeling that Kill Team Iron Maw will be useful um, in the long run. So, I've chosen to go with the, the Barracks, as opposed to the Doctrine Chapel, giving me access to Assault Marines, Scouts, and Sniper Scouts. I've been trying out the Sniper Scouts, and I've been kind of liking them, yet I'm yet after... I, I kind of liked them while I was starting this game, but I'm kind of having second thoughts now as I've been playing it more. And my, my second thoughts... My, my original thinking is just that they have long range, and they really do have long range. The Sniper Scouts have great range. Right now, though, it does feel to me like their damage is, is a little bit lacking. So, you can, but well microed, you can definitely keep them out of harm's way. You can really keep them at a distance because their range is, again, just really, really long. Um, I currently don't feel that they're as impactful as sniper units in Dawn of War 2, but then in the same time, I do feel that sniper units were also very problematic in vanilla um, Dawn of War 2. I think by the Elite mod, Snipers were finally at least figured out in a way that was balanced enough. Although I feel in Vanilla Dawn of War 2 they might have been j just not quite that well designed, to be honest. Here, they're not. The Sniper Scouts are not that problematic, but at the moment I'm not terribly convinced that they really are that effective. So we see them there, and I mean, I'm kind of trying to focus uh, weak squads, but I just feel their damage is a little bit lacking. The setup time and tear, up tear down time is pretty short for them, so you do get them pretty mobile. And with good micro, it is still possible that they could be a good harassment unit. Um, and then, of course, you do have the Assault Marines. And the combination of the Sniper Scouts and the Assault Marines is the reason why, at least like from a theoretical standpoint, before like actually really getting figuring out how the game works, why I've chosen the Barracks over the Doctrine Chapel since the, the Doctrine Chapel really only offers you, at least, again, just from my theory way of looking at it, long-range fire support. You get Devastators. You get Devastators, um, either with Heavy Bolters or Laz Cannons. Either way, it's, it's long-range fire support. Um, whereas I felt with the uh, Barracks, I can get the long-range fire support with Scouts, and then I can also get that melee initiation from the Assault Marines. And I do feel the Assault Marines could be somewhat useful because with the way cover works... Um, melee units are helpful for dealing with cover since ranged units, I believe, can't enter a captured cover barrier at all, whereas um, the snipers, the, the assault marines can just jump right in. In general, melee units can actually just walk into cover, and then of course assault marines can actually jump in, which is helpful because you have areas like these where... Um, the Assault Marines can go around kind of the paths that are blocking. Like, in order to get around to this this cover barrier or cover bubble or whatever, um, most of these units are going to need to walk around, go up the steps, and then kind of go the long way. It could potentially be dangerous. And that's also why the cover is positioned that way. 
um, it's positioned with that advantage of the stairs being kind of a, a blocking point. Um, yeah, so it's just a lot of the, kind of the thoughts I've had of the game so far, kind of what I'm learning. Again, the, the, the camera right now might be a little erratic, especially as it's not corresponding as much to what I'm thinking, but... I, I don't feel that the the moment-to-moment play-by-play is is that strong or even that interesting at this point with me really just learning this game. Right now, I'm just destroying some of the the resource points. As long as there is a slight lull, um, I'm going to talk about my feeling about this game mode. You know, I did say in my open beta impressions that you know the game se seems okay to me, and overall it does seem okay to me. But as I play this game mode a little bit more, this power core game mode, um, to be completely honest, I'm not liking it. What I feel is a bit of a problem is that I don't really feel that there's any way that this game mode really encourages active gameplay. You know, I feel as long as you roughly, you and your opponents are roughly even on your map control and the resource points, I don't think it really just does much to promote active gameplay. It's like, why move forward? Why risk losing squads um, when you're not going to actually achieve much? Especially to actually try to... To actually try to open up a win condition, you need to go for the different st structures that are part of the MOBA-esque influence of this mode. So those structures are the shield generator, and then the turret, and of course, finally, the power core. The shield generator comes first, and dealing with any of these, to, to take out any of those structures, um, is actually a pretty big commitment. So you need to commit your forces, you risk losing them, and if you lose them, like in this game, like... Unlike Dawn of War 2, you really, you really lose squads. You do. Um, it just happens, and sometimes, just regardless of... At least, well, my micro isn't great, so I could be wrong. Um, your micro might not be great, or maybe it even it is. At some point, I think in this game, you are just going to lose squads. So I've taken control of the bubble cover myself, and I know the bubble cover is something that people haven't really liked. Uh, I don't feel that there's anything wrong with the mechanic itself. I think part of just why it hasn't been accepted is that it's being called cover, and that it is so much different from basically the the cover mechanics that have come before it, especially Dawn of War 2, where Dawn of War 2 was much more authentically cover. You know, not necessarily a guarantee of not taking damage, where in Dawn of War 2 is basically um, damage reduction. Um, but the mechanic itself, I think, works out fine, and I think might have been more accepted if it had just been called something like Fortified Position, since that's kind of what it is. Um, you are immune to damage when you are in the cover, which does give you a huge advantage over any other ranged units that try to, basically, try to attack you. Um, you do have to worry about melee units, of course. And the cover can eventually be destroyed by ranged fire, but this does actually take a long time. That was me managing to get a snipe on uh, my opponent's kill team Iron Law. So, I don't know, maybe those sniper scouts are not completely useful. Certainly most other units could not have secured that kill the way the snipers did. And I do feel, I do also feel that for this, at least right now, the way they work, I think for the snipers to really have a noticeable impact, I think they need to be run in pairs at the very least. And, you know, I have talked about how I feel this game right now might not really be promoting aggressive gameplay, and I still stand by that. Right now, we're actually playing very aggressively, but, you know, I think that is in part just because we want to play aggressively. We're playing a real-time strategy game. We want to fight a war. We don't want to stand around and sit on points and, and just wait for someone else to do something. We want to fight. But with this game road, I'm just not really seeing enough of a reason to actually fight other than wanting to. Which might sound ridiculous, because, I mean, of course people are going to play and want to fight, but then there are also people who want to win. And sometimes people who want, want to win analyze how a game works, and sometimes realizing when not fighting is the optimal solution. Um, the even bigger problem with this game is that, not even that I feel that not fighting is not a solution, the problem is I feel like al almost that there isn't really a solution. Um, the solution is to just kind of wait out, wait out the game, build up, finally build up a big enough army that you can actually reasonably commit to actually taking out the MOBA structures, the, the power gener- the, the shield generator, rather, the turret, and then finally the power core. Um, 
And like certainly with the forces, with the army that I have right now, I, I really can't realistically go for... I mean, I could probably get the shield generator if it's left unexposed, but the, the turret, like, almost no way in hell, not even worth it. Uh, the turret is quite powerful and would, would shred my army, wouldn't be worth it. Um, a few other things going on here. So I called down Kill Team Iron Maw, and the thing about the elites, and again, people have different opinions about the elites. What's important to know about the elites is that um, one of the big advantages about the elites is not even the quality of the unit itself, but the fact that you kill down in a you kill down you call down an elite using the elite points, a resource that is completely separate from power or requisition. And you can just call down an elite using elite points only. It doesn't matter what your, your power or your requisition is. That's also one of the things that I like about Kill Team Iron Maw. I feel like Kill Team Iron Maw is coming at a point in the game at two elite points when your resource income or your resources in the bank are probably not even that strong. Now suddenly you get a squad that's in a stronger version of the squads you already have. And, uh, I'm holding my elite points, though, at the moment. I've lately been not getting Gabriel Angelos. Um, because I've been feeling like, yeah, I get Kill Team Iron Maul, get that early elite. But I often feel like if I go for Gabriel Angelos, I'm going to have a lot of trouble getting Solaria later. And I've been wanting to try to get Solaria. Uh, Solaria's cool, Solaria's fun. Um... Building some things in my drop pod so they'll be coming down soon. And being aggressive again, even though I don't believe it'll actually get me anything. Uh, one of the things that we're starting to see, that my scouts have been kind of getting hit by, and yet kind of not because they're safe in cover, is Whirlwind Missile Barrages. And we'll probably see that more as the game goes on. But Whirlwinds in this game actually do kind of function a lot like uh, Manticores in Dawn of War 2. They're definitely good, although maybe not quite as lethal as the Manticore in Dawn of War 2. Because a Manticore in Dawn of War 2 is really like, if you weren't paying attention, you really could lose many different kinds of squads. Even, even fairly tough ones. Um, the Whirlwind, maybe not that quite um, devastating, but I think still pretty good. The Whirlwind does have pretty good range. And when it hits a squad, it does hurt. It does hurt. It knocks them down. They, they like, can't move for a few seconds. Uh, and they will take enough damage that if they try to go back into combat, they, they will actually risk dying. They'll probably take um, at least one model loss, possibly more. M most likely more than that. If anything, it feels like whenever my squads get caught in um, a Manticore, not a Manticore, a Whirlwind Barrage, they're losing about half their health. That being said, it could actually just be that I'm getting hit by multiple Whirlwind Missile Barrages. Sometimes it's hard to tell, um, especially if you group up the units and uh, group up the units or group up the Whirlwinds and then just issue multiple Barrage Orders at once. Right now we're going to take down uh, our opposing Angelos with our rather overwhelming forces. <laughs> um, I'm also not terribly convinced with how, with how listening posts are. I mean... The listening posts don't feel that impactful at the moment. Like you put them, you put them on your your own points, and that will at least delay for a little bit. But they're also pretty easy to take out, and um, I don't feel that they'll they'll stay. I'm not even sure if the listening posts actually increase your your resource generation. Whereas, as best as I can remember, Dawn of War One. Um, Having a listen, listening post, in fact, you know what, not as best as I can remember now, because now I can remember well enough to say confidently that yes, listening post in Dawn of War 1 did increase your resource generation. I'm not even 100% positive that that's the case in this game. So that's me getting hit by a Manticore, not a Manticore. I keep on saying Manticore, because it does feel a bit like a Manticore, but that was me getting hit by um, a Whirlwind Missile Barrage. It, again, it, it does hurt. So I'm at the point where I'm actually starting to get some vehicles, and the vehicles I'm getting are land speeders. So the land speeders are actually a rather deliberate choice based on just a few things I've learned about the game so far. Um, the land speeders... What's good about the land speeders, uh, one thing is just their mobility. They're certainly very fast. Oh man, I lost both my sniper scout squads right there. They got stunned by something. Um... The land speeders are highly mobile, so they're very fast. They're like, most of the times, like, 
when you're moving your army around this battlefield, it, it feel like it'll take a while to get to like another part of the battlefield. With the land speeder, you're pretty fast. Those land speeders are fast. They're going to get places quickly. They are fragile, though. Um, but they can also equip a multi-melta, which I've been finding is pretty good for hunting down those whirlwinds, as long as your opponent doesn't protect them too well. If I start running into an opponent that is actually protecting their whirlwinds pretty well, uh, I wouldn't be quite as confident in, in getting these, these land speeders. But slap a multi-melta on them, uh, run them in, hit a whirlwind, they're going to do some damage, and they'll actually kill the whirlwind pretty quickly. The whirlwind obviously probably made to be somewhat fragile as well. Um, since it's not supposed to be exposed, and those land speeders are probably pretty good at, at just flanking around things. There are definitely uh, a few more lulls in this game than I would say, like in a game like Dawn of War 2. And again, like, obviously, I'm going to compare things to Dawn of War 2 because that's my favorite Dawn of War game. And, you know, regardless of the scale or the faithfulness of Dawn of War 2 and that being an authentic 40k experience, what. What I like about Dawn of War 2, just as a game, is that it, it was a very, very active game. And I think a lot of that comes from the victory point in game mode, where it's like, you need to take the resources to put yourself in a winning position, um, or the, the victory points. And if you just sit and do nothing, your opponent's going to take the points. And then you should, you would actually start losing. And you need, you need to make a move in order to actually get something done. Um... Dawn of War 2's victory point mode really forced you to be active. Or at least it forced one player to be active. Maybe if one player was... Um, if one player does actually have a, a map control advantage, they can actually afford to be a little bit more passive and defensive. And th But that puts the other player on the offensive. If your opponent's winning on map control, you need to be on the offensive, you need to take the re retake the map control, or you're going to lose. Um, by comparison in this game, is the problem I feel with this game mode is that I feel like it doesn't really force either side to be on the offensive. Here are those land speeders coming around, getting an exposed whirlwind. Easy money. Um, the other one is a little bit more um, protected, so I'm not being quite as aggressive. Uh, instead, I'm taking advantage of the, I guess, the anti-armor damage of that multi-melt to, to actually hit the, the buildings that are right here. So production buildings are... It actually is helpful to make a forward production building. Even though they're safer in base, but the advantage of a forward production building is that you can put that production building... Um, no, sorry. You may want to make a forward production building because you can reinforce from it as well as heal. Um, production buildings uh, have reinforced as well as hearing, healing auras. And I believe if you get the Blessing of the Omnissiah Doctrine, they will even repair vehicles. So, it's helpful to have a forward production building, and one of the things in a team game is that you can benefit from a, a forward production building even if it's your allies. So, you could have some orcs building huts, and you can bring some space marines right out of that. So, this is at the point where we are pretty decisively making a, a win in this game. Like, we're gonna win. Like, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll spoil it, we're gonna win. Um, I do think that uh, one of the opposing players actually dropped at some point, so that gave us a pretty big advantage. And at, at the moment, the system in Dawn of War 2 doesn't really have any way to either penalize, prevent, or discourage dropping. And, uh, I mean, certainly, like, if one of your teammates drops, like, you can just drop. Um, I, I think the main thing, actually, is just that you don't get um, the the elite experience or the skulls. So, we're gonna make a push now for that, uh... That's the turret. We destroyed the shield generator. Since the shield generator is not quite as... It can't defend itself quite as well, whereas the turret does have much stronger defenses. But now we've got a massive enough force between Solaria, a Wraith Knight jumping in, um, that we're, we're gonna take this. So... Uh, another thing that I, I do feel about this game, and some people have mentioned it, is that beyond a certain point, it, it often does feel like once you really can begin a decisive siege on your enemy's uh, power core, shield generator, turret, and whatnot, like once the siege starts, like it's you're, you're probably winning. 
and this game, again, also with how I've said that the, this game mode, I feel, doesn't really force either player to be active. Um, doesn't really, I feel like it doesn't really have back and forth. Really. So, and you know, I, I realize that right now what I'm saying is uh, actually quite a bit more critical of the game than I was in my open beta impressions video. And I mean, to be fair, part of the reason is I actually just have more experience playing the game uh, than when I did that. Several more games under my belt, not even a whole lot. Um, I still don't feel like it's a terrible game, but, I mean, I, th like, it's, I do have some bias in that regard, just that I, I really did prefer Dawn of War 2. I do feel, my personal opinion is, even if, if, my personal opinion is, if you take 40k completely out of the picture, um, mechanically, Dawn of War 2 is, is the best game out of all of them pretty easily. I know not everyone may agree with that, and you are free to disagree. It's, it's just my opinion, and I'm not going to be one to just say that my opinion is right and yours, yours is wrong. It comes from different perspectives, as well as just what we all like and dislike. Alright, so we're coming to the close of the game. Looks like I'm focusing on units when... Oh, so unfortunately destruction of the power core has been delayed. Um, They've offered some protective abilities for each of the defensive structures. So in this case, the power core can basically close itself up, and I believe it's for 45 seconds it will be completely involved. But honestly, by the time you get into the position where you would have to use that ability, your power core is, gonna pretty, is pretty much guaranteed just to die anyway. Alright. That about does it for this game. Those are some of my further thoughts in Dawn of War 3. Hope you enjoyed the cast.